Welcome to the Northwest Accounting Educators Conference. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the new features in Excel 2010. Here's a list of 20 items that I've selected. There's lots more, but these are ones I think are particularly useful. One thing to note, though, however, is one of the main things Excel did Microsoft did is they they changed statistical functions. So standard deviation, the old function used to be stdev, the new function is stdev.s. We'll briefly look at that. Most of us aren't statisticians, but we will take a look. Now here's the whole list. We'll go through this workbook has a bunch of sheets. And if you want to download this workbook and follow along, it's called NAE-XL2010.XLSM. You can click on the link below the video and download it. All right, let's get started here. We're going to click on the sheet Spark Lines. Now, in this workbook, we'll have a sheet where you can work if you want, and then there's the answer. Hey, here's what a spark line looks like. Here's a column chart of this data and a line chart of this data here. These are called cell charts. Very easy to create. We're back on Spark Lines uh, Sheet 1. Uh, spark lines created by Edward Tufte. Uh, he's written a bunch of great books about articulating quantitative data visually. And this was his idea. Microsoft put it in in 2010. You simply highlight, go to insert, just like you were going to do a chart. But here's spark lines. I'm going to click columns, data range. So there I have my data range. Click OK. All right, so now we have some columns. You can do things like high point, oh, a different color, low point. Come over here. You could change the colors if you want. Marker color, I'm going to say high point is going to be green. And how about low point will be uh, red. Now, the max here is 30. The max here is 25. And this one is 18. They all look the same height to me. So I'm going to go over to Design, Sparkline Tools, Design, Axis. And I'm going to say under Vertical Axis Max. Let's say same for all Sparklines. So, and now we can see clearly uh, the 30 is going to be the height for all of these. So we can see relative position. Let's go down here. Here's some sales. By the way, in all these sheets, there'll be uh, some notes and references to other videos. If you have the workbook, you can just click on these, and it will take you there, or else type these titles into Google or wherever you want. Let's go up to Insert. Let's do a uh, line. It'll be just like a line chart. Here's our data. Day 1 to 7, click OK. You could do the same thing, high point, low point. Change the color. The low point we'll say is red. All right, so Sparkline's awesome new cell chart. Let's go over to the next sheet. Hey, what's this one? We have the, uh, oh, Sparkline 2. Uh, this is a data set. I actually have a bunch of data over here randomizing. If I hit F9, uh oh, I think my randomizing key is going to. Uh, Effect. Let's see. so F9 is pause on my. All right, so uh, I'm going to have to go up to formulas, uh, calculation. Actually, let's go over here, recalculate, and you can see that the this is dynamic, right? So this data, all these uh, um, spark lines are linked to that data over there. So every time I recalculate, it recalculates. One thing that's annoying though is sparklines by default don't come with labels, just like a, a regular chart would. I made a little formula here. All I did was say, hey, give me the max of all these. And I used the join symbol, Shift-7. And this little formula element, character, there's the all of the ASCII characters, 255. Character 10 is a hard return. So I put join symbol, and I joined the max with a hard return. And then I joined it with another hard return and 0. And there I have my label. So it's always looking through here and telling me the uh, max value there. Hey, let's go look at our next awesome 2010 feature. I'm going to go to the sheet control keyboards. Now we want to talk about copying and pasting, but a certain type of pasting. We want to do something called paste special. Let's just say we want to copy this table. 
copy is control C. But when I paste it right here, I want to transpose it. That means take the row headers and make them column headers, and the column headers and make them row headers. We've always been able to do that by going paste and then clicking on paste special and doing this transpose. But lo and behold, look what they did in 2010. They added a bunch of icons. Now there's transpose. But check this out. What's so nice about these is you can get a preview. As I point to each one of these, there's paste, there's paste uh, formulas, there's column widths, there's transpose. It gives you a preview. There's paste special values. Values changes the formulas to actual hard-coded values. So that's one great thing about 2010. I'm going to click this transpose. Now I want to undo this and show you a couple other great features associated with this uh, new paste special. I could use this up here, undo, but I'm going to use always use control Z, that's undo. Now watch this. What's a keyboard shortcut for paste? Control V. So I don't really want to have to go up here and mess with the ribbon. It usually takes longer to use your mouse. Notice this smart tag and that there's a control there. What happens if I hit control now? It pops open. I notice that right there it says T. Well, first off, I could just see the smart tag and then use this and transpose, right? I'm going to control Z again. But no, no, I'm, I'm, I want keyboard shortcuts because they're fast. You can control V, holding control and then V. In succession, I then hit control and T. So once you get the hang of it, it's quite fast. I'm going to control Z again because there's still another way to use this amazing new paste special. There is something called a right click key, and it's in between Alt and Control on your keyboard. If I hit right click, notice some of the common paste specials come up. I already know that transposes T, so I hit T and then Enter. So there's a bunch of new uh, tricks. Paste special, either the Control uh, Smart tag there, or this up here, or the right click key. Let's look at another great paste special. Now notice when I click in this cell, that's a formula. I'm actually looking one, two, three, four, four cells to my left. Now if I want this number, this is the overall total for this, I just want to paste it as a value. I can control C. If I were to control V, I get a reference error, of course, because the formula was looking four cells to my left. And here, there's only two cells, so reference says, there's not, a, there's not enough cell references. I could, of course, come here and values. And there I have it. But watch this. Control C, and let's use our right click key. Now, for some reason, right click the uh, V right here. If I just hit right click and then V, it works. Now, this is a common task for many people. They have formulas. They want to convert to values. So right click key. V. That's new in 2010. Let's try this again. I, I can't, if we're doing paste special, I got to show you a great uh, trick here. And by the way, all these notes are here. I've selected this cell. I know I want to paste special it right down here. Well, let's just do it with the mouse. Notice that cursor right there is the move cursor. Now, normally I just move it and it would just move it as a formula. That's not going to work. But if you right click the edge and drag, when you get it to the location you want to drop it, let go, and what happens? A little pop-up menu, and there's copy here as, pay, as values only. I, I don't know about you, but I pay special values all the time, and I love this right-clicking. You can even do the whole column, right? Drag it down here. Copy here as values. All right, let's go to our next topic, pivot table slicers. Let's click on the sheet PT slicers answer and just take a preview of this. I created this pivot table, and these are called slices. They're really report filters, or in the old age, page filters. Just a user interface, if I click on Carlota, instantly this is updated. If I say uh, product Carlota, customer PC, uh, and then just keep all the sales rep that are relative, I have instantly filtered my pivot table. The ones in uh, gray mean they're, Joe didn't sell any uh, Carlota product to PCC. Now let's go over to PT Slicer and see if we can uh, create this from scratch. Not hard at all. Just basically insert Slicer. I am going to create a pivot table. There's always notes up here and, and reference videos if you want them. When creating a pivot table, you always have field names in the first row, records in rows, no blanks. 
no blank columns or rows or anything, not even blank cells. You can have blank cells, but it's not uh, helpful. We go up to Insert, Pivot Table, Pivot Table. The keyboard shortcut is Alt-N-V-T. All right, it's going to ask us. It guessed right because we have the right table format. I'm going to say in this existing sheet, and I'm going to click an H1. All right. I'm going to scroll over here. Now, we're going to do uh, date. We're going to drag it down here to row labels. Now, notice what happens. This summarizes daily dates. If we were to drag our sales over there, that's pretty cool in itself, right? It just summarizes daily date. But we want monthly and yearly. So I'm going to right click and group. Grouping is so easy in a pivot table as compared to doing this with formulas. There's months because we have multiple years. You want to click years too or all the Januarys will be together and then click OK. So there's our little uh, table which we want. Now by default since 2007 there's this horrible style that puts row labels. I really want to see the name of the field here so I have to go back up to pivot tables tools design and on every pivot table I ever do I come down and show in tabular. Alright so now I see oh years and date much more useful. Alright now how do we do a slicer? I'm gonna go ahead and close this field list options insert slicer I'm going to say product customer and sales and then click OK they come out like this I'm going to move them and then format them a little bit you can get fancier when you have more time something like that and we can color them. I'll put the first one blue, the second one red, and red and blue make purple or lavender there. All right, check this out. Uh, I'll click on Bellin. Boom! It's just showing you the results for all of the months for Bellin for all the customers. If I click uh, PCC, those are just um, the product Bellin sold to customer PCC and we can see that Chin through Sue only Sue down here didn't sell any if I click a, a QFC you can see Joe and Sue didn't sell any so just amazing user interface and of course from pivot tables you can make charts and then uh, this is a filter system that works uh, for the pivot table and the chart slice is pretty amazing now let's go over to our next sheet new print we're going to the sheet new print now print what do we usually do? We users, we hit Control P, Enter, right? And we go over to the printer, and it's printing out all funny, and all the pages didn't come out the way we want. So what Microsoft did is they said, let's force people to look at Print Preview. So they've combined Print Preview and the Print Dialog Box. So now when you Control P, there it is, Print Dialog Box and the Print Preview. Now I can already see here there's a missing column and as I scroll forward I could see also that there's no information up here column headers telling me what all this is. So I need to do some page setup. Absolutely awesome. They force me to look at print preview. Now I want to close this. Don't click the red X up there. You could click that or you can close this print print slash print preview with escape. All right. Now I'm going to do page setup. Some of the things I want to do in Page Setup, even though Control P, it gives you some portrait uh, options and Page Setup. That Page Setup doesn't let me to set um, set column header, so I'm going to click Escape and do the real Page Setup, Page Layout, and I'm going to go straight to the Page Setup dialog box where all of the things I want are. Not all the things that I'm going to use are up in the ribbon. Now I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut Alt. PSP. All right, I want portrait. And a great trick, this is a amortization table. It has 370 rows or something like that. If I say fit to, because I want it to fit, right, because there's something hanging out there, I want it to do automatically. One page by, well, I don't know how many. It could be six, it could be seven. But here's a great trick. I do want it wide, but I don't know how many tall. You delete. Don't put a zero or a one or a ten. Delete it. By leaving tall blank, it'll just print out as many as necessary. I'm going to go to margins, click horizontal. There's already a bunch of headers and footers for the workbook. Um, let's do 
I don't want any of that right there. So I'm going to say print area. And watch this. I'm going to highlight. And I don't want to highlight all the way down. So I'm going to use a trick. And I'll use this later in the video too. Control Shift down arrow goes down to the bottom of the current region. Now this trick, Control, control Shift down arrow works when we're in print dialog box. It'll work when we do formatting. It'll work when we're putting ranges into functions. All right, so I got that rows to repeat at top. Now I could scroll over here and scroll all the way up, which be, would be fine. But I'm going to use the keyboard circuit control home. And it just jumps over there. Now that's not what I want, but it's a quick way to jump up at the top. And now I'm going to highlight. And what rows to repeat at top does is it will repeat this variable information at the top. Actually, we want the variable information at the top and the field names. All right, so now I have my page set up. I click OK. Now when I control P, I can see it looks like it's doing pretty good. It's got that. And as I scroll forward, sure enough, all this information is at the top of each page. Now I can control P. I can do whatever whatever options I want over here. The beauty is they're combined now. I'm going to click Escape. Let's go to our next topic. Negative data bars. Now, I'm going to click on the answer here. And negative data bars, we're going to uh, do conditional formatting to show a bar going backwards to the left when it's negative and to the right when it's positive. Now, this is conditional formatting. If you haven't seen conditional formatting, home ribbon right here. This was new in 2007. It is profound. Uh, the built-in features they added, you could do highlight. Uh, greater than, less than, or, and give it a value. Top, you can get top 10%, top 10 items, all sorts of things. We're going to look at data bars. Now, I'm going to go back over here. This is what the finished version. Let's go back on this sheet right here. And let's just show you some of the amazing features. This is from earlier, 2007. This was, uh, pre this was um, introduced into Excel. But you highlight the range, and you simply go up. And it's going to look through each individual cell. and compare it to the average for all of them. So you go up here, top and bottom rules, above average. Now, my, now by default, it comes up with something, but simply click here, and you can choose some of the other defaults. Or boom, there's the real power, custom formatting. I'm going to go to fill, say boop. Uh, that's a dark, dark value. So I'm going to go to font and make it a light value. So there's a good contrast there. And then they're instantly above average. And that is dynamic. If you change this to 5,000, instantly they all change. I'm going to Control Z. Now, uh, this we're going to do a cell chart. And notice we have the values here. And over here, we have our negatives. We'll see that in just a moment. But let's just see how this data bar works without negatives. Now, I would like the bar going horizontally to show up here. But I need a value in the cell. So I'm going to highlight this. And I've highlighted the whole range. And there's an active cell. If you build an, some, put something into that cell and do Control-Enter, it'll populate all the cells. So I'm going to do a formula equals one cell to the left, and then Control-Enter. That populates all of them. And then you could see like that. Control-Shift-Down arrow to highlight all that. And now you see the values here. But we can ask conditional formatting to put a bar and not show the value. So I'm going to come up to Conditional Formatting, Data Bars. And uh, this one right here is a solid. Right here is a uh, gradient fill. I'm going to do solid. All right, and so what does it do? It shows you relatively the uh, distance of a horizontal bar. So if I change this to 9,000, it'll instantly become the largest bar, and all the other ones adjust. Now let's do here equals one cell to the left, control enter. Now let's do same thing, but now data bars in 2010, they'll show negatives uh, to the left and positive to the right. Pretty cool. All right, conditional formatting, if you haven't checked that out, you could see it's just totally self-explanatory. Now I have lots of videos on conditional formatting. These two are on the data bars, but here, this one right here, if you want to if you haven't looked at conditional formatting, this is a great video highlighting Excel Class 21. It has 12 examples of conditional formatting, both built-in and true-false logical formulas. I actually have a bunch of videos at YouTube on conditional formatting. Now, let's go to our next topic. Ah, some new pivot table calculations.
whoa, wait a second. You know, I totally forgot to show you how to turn these numbers off. Totally simple. Before we get to our pivot table calculations, let's finish this up. Highlight here, and we go back up to conditional formatting and manage rules. And you, here's our rule. We can double click it or click edit. And right there, show data bar only. Click OK. Click OK. Right here. And then the keyboard shortcut to jump up to manage rules, Alt O D. Alt O D. If you do a lot of conditional formatting, that's pretty fast. Show bar only. All right, so there we go. Now, let's go over and look at our uh, new pivot table calculations. Now I'm going to click on this. It says New PT Calculations, the answer sheet. I want to give you a preview. Here's our pivot table, and we're going to look at three new features in 2010. Now, here's a pivot table we summarized by year and month. Here's the sum values. Here's the running total. So this is a running total by month. Um, there's various statistical charts you might uh, build with uh, this calculation here. And then we have percentage of running total. This is what is new in 2010. We used to have to build this part of the pivot table and then do this calculation outside. right? So the old method would be something like that, a formula outside the pivot table. But now it's built in. We'll see how to do that. Another great feature added in 2010, we have sales rep summarized by product. And there's the sum. And there's this new calculation, percent of parent. Now what this does is each one of these items here is given as a percentage of the chin total. So here's chin, the sales rep. There's the total. And each individual amount for product is shown here. And the percentage is shown as this total right here. Now the one odd thing about this percent of parent is that it switches here. Instead of showing 100% here, it's comparing this chin total to the overall total. All right, so we'll see how to do that one. And finally, the third feature in 2010 we'll see is here's just a straight pivot table, uh, month 2010, month sales running total. Uh, percentage of running total. But in earlier versions, it would list 2010 just once. Well, there's a format uh, 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 format you can um, apply that'll show this as a real database and repeat this variable here. And we'll see how to do that. Let's go new PT calculation. Click on that sheet right here. Uh, here's the calculations we're going to do. Here are some reference videos. This one in particular has 15 examples of pivot tables. All right. I'm going to create these pivot tables on a new sheet. I'm going to click in a field names at the top, records in rows, no blanks anywhere, no certainly no blanks all the way down a column or a row, single cell selected, insert pivot table, pivot table, or use the keyboard shortcut, Alt NVT. I'm going to put this on a uh, sorry new sheet, click OK. Actually, that could have been Alt NVT, Enter, all one uh, keyboard shortcut. All right, I'm going to double click this and say PT1. Now we're going to take our date and drag it down to the rows. Immediately we're given daily dates. And if we drag our sales over here, that's beautiful. That summarizes each day sales. But I want to group this by year and month. Right click, group. Now I know that this data set has all 2010. So I don't really need to click here. But I'm always careful. I click both uh, and click OK. Now. If there is only one year, it'll show it just once. You can go ahead and uncheck year here, right? And it will just show that. But I do want to show this. I'm going to click Control Z, Z. All right, so there we have our data set, sum of sales. We know we need running total and percent running total. So I just drag my sales down here twice. I'm going to come here and right click. And I could go down to Value Field Settings. What's nice about this dialog box, you can change the name, the function, or the calculation. Click Cancel. In 2007-10, of course, you have these drop downs. So I'm going to show, show value as. And I'm going to do running total. Now, this calculation was in 2007, it's, or in earlier versions. Date, it's based on the date. Click OK. Click here, and let's change the name, running. Total. 
tab, and I'm going to put percent running total. Enter, enter. All right, so right click, and let's show values as. And here's the new one, percent running total in. Absolutely awesome. Based on date, click OK. I love that calculation. All right, uh, let's go back to our data set here. And we'll create our second one, percent uh, of parent total. Make sure a single cell is selected, and we'll use our keyboard shortcut, Alt, N, V, T, and then Enter, because we know we want it on a new sheet. Now, in this pivot table, we want sales rep and product. All right, immediately, I'm going to go up to design, report, and show it in tabular. There we have our names uh, there. And we need our sales figure down in the values area twice. Now, this is fine here, but let's change this. Right click, show values as, and this awesome new feature. This is percent of parent row total. So I click that, and instantly I have, for example, this $632.50 is 6.14%. That means of Chin's total, that amount right there, Sunshine product is 6.14%. Now, the one thing that's annoying, like I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, is that this is not 100%. This is showing percent of overall total. But that is a great new calculation. And let's not forget to label correctly, percent Looks like I can't type or spell. <laughs> Whoops. So I'm going to hit F2 to put it in edit mode and then get rid of that R. Notice I double clicked and it opened up the uh, double click, and it opens up the value field setting. Now, that's pivot table number two. So I'm going to be sure and name this pivot table two. You know, you can give it a better name like whatever you want, but let's just name it that for now. Now let's go back here and do one last uh, pivot table. You know, I forget what was our calculation. It doesn't really matter. I just want to show you how, boom, you can uh, list all of a variable multiple times if you want a real data set. Watch this. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go back over here. And you know, I didn't change this uh, to design report layout tabular. Now I can see my years. That's much better already. But watch this. I'm going to copy this. You can just copy a pivot table, control C. I'm going to come over here and I want to insert a sheet right there. I could use there's a button there somewhere. You could right click the sheet tab and insert, but I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut shift F11. There it is. I'm going to put uh, PT3 and then I'm going to click right there and control V. Oops, it didn't retain it. Control C, Control V. Go to the smart tag and say, boom. Now, notice that was a W. We saw earlier how to use these control. So I could just do Control W. And it's got the column width. Now, what do we want to do here? All you got to do to list the 2010 multiple times is go to Design. And look at this under Report Layout, Repeat All Item Labels. Now, there were a bunch of tricks before 2010 to get uh, those to show up multiple times. So this is like a real a data set. All right, those are some awesome three new 2010 pivot table features. Let's go to our next calculation. Ooh, this is a great one. Net working days. Now I have um, some video reference videos here, but let's look at the problem. There was the old function networking days. And what does networking days do? It shows you the working days, and it's a great function. You have a start and an end. And there it is. It says 10 working days. And it considers holidays. Just let's look at this. The first argument is start date, end date, and holidays. But guess what? Does everyone have Saturday and Sunday off? No way. So before 2010, you had to do some crazy formulas. Look at this formula over here. Boom. That was to figure out if you wanted Monday and Tuesday. And there's a bunch of va variations uh, and different formulas to calculate this. And they're pretty well known, listed at various websites or search on Google. But so many people do this that, of course, Microsoft said, well, we better fix this. And look at this. There's a new function. 
equals net, and there's net working days, the old one, and international. It just adds what a weekend argument, and here's the list, 1 to 17. So ours was Monday and Tuesday, right? So we would put a 3. Omitted or 1 is Saturday and Sunday. So let's see how this works. Start, comma, end, comma, and the weekend, I'm actually going to link it to a cell here and lock this. Oh, notice this is beautiful. There's a bunch of functions that now uh, have drop downs like this, and you're really helpful, especially when you, you have no idea when a new function like this, which one to choose. Visually, there it is. But I'm going to link this and hit the F4 key, comma, and then holidays. You could highlight those, or if you have, you know, a bunch of blank cells, the blank cells will not affect it, so you can add any uh, that you want later, and I'm going to hit F4. All right, let's copy this down. What I want to do with one is just to make sure that it works the same as this one, and sure enough, it does. Double click and send it down. Now, if I change this to three, that is heaven for doing uh, payroll or number of days worked or whatever. Uh, you need those networking days for. And sure enough, here's that crazy formula over here, and it gives us the same result. All right, so networking days. Now, this international shows up in a few functions. There are other date-related functions that have the same problems. Let's go over to the sheet work day. Absolutely awesome. Uh, well, let's compare this. Networking days gives us number of days. Workday function gives us an actual date in the future. So here's the start date, which is an input into our function. You say 16 days into the future. So for a project, right, you have your start date, you add 16 days, and then there's the uh, work date in the future, including holidays. Now notice, it's just going to need a start number of days and holidays. Same problem as the earlier net work day, it doesn't consider anything but Saturday and Sunday to be a weekend. So down here, if Friday and Saturday are our weekend, we'll not use work day, we'll use work day international. Now, I'm going to arrow down and then tab, that feature came in in 2007, start date, comma, days, the weekend, I'm just going to uh, hard code it in, I think that's off the screen. So there, I think you can see it. There's the seven. And then comma, the holidays. Now, one thing about this is this 16 is being added to that, right? So this is assuming Friday is not part of our calculation. This, is, this 16 is pushing from this Friday 16 days out. Now, sometimes you are calculating project end date. So if Friday is included, Friday is included in this calculation, the second, we'd simply say equals international. We do the start date comma, the number of days, minus 1, comma, and then the 7, and our holidays. Oh, look at that. For some reason, it didn't come formatted. But what do we do? We simply uh, go up and do date, right? All dates are serial numbers, number of days since December 31st, 1899, where January 1st, 1900 is 1. Now, actually, I'm going to copy that formatting there, I'll just so I know that it's got that custom format there. All right, so Workday International and that Networking Days International, totally amazing. Now, let's go over and look at one of the largest changes in 2010. I'm going to click on the sheet uh, stdev.s. Now, here we have... Well, so there's about 50 new statistical functions. Um, and I have a link here for this particular function, stdev. I don't think I have. So over here, we'll talk about I have a, an actual link for a playlist of about 100 
plus videos that will show you a lot of the new statistical functions. But this is a huge change. Now, let's look at two stats functions. Average, the mean, the arithmetic mean. So I have stock A and stock B. So I'm going to do equals average. Now, this function has not changed. Right? This is an example of a statistical function that has not changed. So I highlight that range. Those are relative cell references. I control enter and I copy it over. All right, so stock return for A and B, 4.1. So we're, we don't care. We'll pick either one. Ah, not true. We need to know how volatile, what's the deviation, or more uh, correctly, or a, a, another way of thinking about uh, this measure, we need to look at here's return for stock B and stock A. They're both exactly at about 4.1. But which data set has more spread? This one right here. This one's more tightly clustered right around the mean. So a way to think of standard deviations, which is the calculation we're looking at, is here's the mean. How fairly does that mean represent all of its data points? Because remember, why do we have averages? We have an average so that we have one value. Here's this value that represents all those data points, and this value represents all those data points. And then we can do, you know, talk about the data set using one value or use it in budgeting or, or decision making. So this one, visually, we could see it's more spread out. So this mean doesn't represent its data points as fairly as this one represents its data points. That's really what standard deviation tells you in uh, finance and stocks, it tells you the risk, which means the volatility. Here's the old function, STDEV. Now notice down here, these are called compatibility functions. These are the new ones they want you to use. I'm going to use this one. Notice it says STDEV. There's no S to indicate that it's a sample. So in 2010, they redid all the, the functions. Some of them, they actually changed the, the algorithm of how they calculate. Other ones, they did not. But for the ones like this one, we will get the same calculation whether we use STDEV or STDEV.S. But they wanted to update it to make it more explicit. This is for a sample. This is for a population. So we're going to use this one. Highlight this right here. And there's lots of functions where not um, in in a lot of stats functions that use this. Uh, you have the old compatibility functions and then the new version. So we can see STDEV. That gives us the calculation. Let's do the new one, STDEV. And I'm going to do dot .s. That means sample. These will give us the same exact calculation. Now they have this new function, and they want, the, want you to use those going, going forward. But this old function works just fine. All right, so STDEV, that tells us standard deviation. Here's a single calculation. Instead of having to labor through doing a chart like that, which is uh, quite difficult, we can uh, simply see, oh yeah, this one has much more uh, volatility or dispersion or risk. The standard deviation, we could see that this one does not, that 4.1 does not represent all of its data points as fairly as this one. So we would, if we were you know, conservative and didn't want to take as much risk, we take this stock here. Let's look at one other function on norm.s.dist. Uh, this is in this uh, stats video, so uh, nor this is a normal distribution, and the s means we're using a z value input. So here's our test score mean from past data. Here's our standard deviation. From past data, we have noticed that the distribution is bell-shaped. That means we can use this function here. We have an x of 20, and we want to figure out what's the probability of getting a score less than or equal to 20. That's what the norm s disk function or the new one. Now, this is an example of a stats function where these two are totally different. The actual inputs are different. So let's do the old one. We're going to get the, the same answer. So norm. And here's our compatibility functions down there. They have that little icon there. So norm, these ones are for when you have no z. These ones are for when you have a z. So norm s dist. This will go from a particular z value and tell you the probability. Now, these are all, always cumulative probabilities from negative infinity to our x. So there's our z, or I'm sorry, z. And there it is. 0.14625 is the probability that we get a score 20 or less. Here's our new function, and it's just totally different. 
right? Norm s dis. Again, they've all stats function, distribution function like this, use this dot convention. There's Poisson, binome, um, f dist, all sorts of functions like that. All right, so there's our z. Notice we have an extra argument. So our z is this. Now, cumulative in the stats videos, here's a reference right here. Oh, actually, here's a great video that shows just uh, the normal distribution functions. But this list here and this one have probably 20 or 30 videos on the new stats video, uh, functions in 2010. Cum cumulative, uh, that's, for, that's the one we want. Probability density function, that's for when you're creating charts. That's the height. Now, you could put true or 1. And there you go. So we would say here, con conclude based on past data, the probability that we could get a score of 20 or less is 14.3. Oh. That's not dollars. Uh, nevertheless, all right, stats functions, there's two examples. Let's go over to the sheet rank. Now, this is not uh, a stats function uh, proper, but it is an example of a function where they made a big improvement. Ranking, we often want to rank, all right? So we have some CPA scores, and we want to uh, rank. So we're going to use the rank function. Now look at this. So rank, there's two new ones, .av and .eq. This old rank, it just, when it got a tie, because you can see there's a tie, it gave them the same score. So let's see how this works. I'm going to show you the old compatibility function. Whoops. The actual number. That's the number to rank, comma, the reference. That means all the values it's comparing it against. I'm going to hit F4. And then the order. Descending, uh, and in 2007, these screen tips came in absolutely awesome. It says rank number as if reference were in a list sorted in descending order. Actually, we don't, that's not a good example of this. Some of them give us better description. But I'm going to put a 0 here. This is simply going to give the biggest score, 1. All right, so that's 14. Double click and send it down so we can see, oh, 97. Biggest score is 1. Now, this rank.eq, they want you to, to use eq now instead of this one. It means equivalent. That means a tie is ranked equivalent. All right, so rank, I did it again. So I got to pay attention. Down arrow tab. So we do this, comma, same exact inputs, F4, comma, 0. Control Enter, double click, and send it down. The new function they created is this rank.av. Now, I love this because in boomerang competition, we used to have to do a wild formula, which I'll show you in just uh, a moment here, because uh, in boomerang competition, ties were given uh, equivalent score. So in essence, there was a tie for 7, so they added 7 and 8 and divided by 2. All right, so now this is built in totally awesome. F4 to lock it, comma, 0. All right, so still, we get a, a similar ranking, but for ties, uh, we get 7.5, 7.5. 7 7 Notice there's no 8. It jumps up to 9. Here, there's no 8 either. It jumps up to 9. Here's an example of a formula we had to do in the old days. So this rank.av, totally great addition. Uh, there's a couple reference videos up there, including there's other types of ranking you want, might want to do. There's a video with 10 examples of ranking. Let's go down here. Two more topics. Now. The aggregate function is a new function. I'm actually not going to do an example here. This is a, just an amazing function, one of my favorite features, because it can help um, with advanced array formulas. Now, I have 11 videos on the, or 12 videos on the uh, aggregate function, so you can look this up. But it's similar to subtotaling, um, and it has some array features that are, are pretty amazing. All right, So if you want to learn more about that, there's more than you'd ever. It, actually, these 12 videos go through basically all aspects of this very vast function. Finally, one, uh, two more topics, actually. I do want to show you how to 
customize the ribbon. This is the ribbon here. Now the quat, that's this right here. If I right click and say show quick access toolbar below the ribbon, people love toolbars. And in 2003 and before, you could you had more power to customize than you do now. But you can add buttons. Now right you let's say you wanted um, decimal right click and notice add to quick access toolbar that is so cool right click add to quick access toolbar all right so you can build your own customized uh, quat quick access toolbar by right clicking however there is a more extensive list of features you can add. And by the way, the quat was customizable in 2007. If you come down here quick access toolbar here's the new feature, quick access, oh, I'm sorry, uh, shh, customize the ribbon. That's the new one in 2010. But let's just take a quick look here. Now, quick access toolbar um, here, you always want to go and show all commands. Now, the beauty, there's two awesome things about this list. This shows you all the features in Excel, including items that are not in the ribbons. So for example, you can hover your cursor here and notice it says command not in ribbon another great and then you add it you add it to the quick access toolbar here and then there it's now on the toolbar another great use for this list is if you were in earlier versions 2003 and you you always use 3d rotation right and you don't know where it is now you can hover your cursor over this list and it tells you where it is chart tools ribbon tab layout tab um, background, 3D rotation, etc. All right, so quick access toolbar, you click OK, and there's the star. But the new feature in 2010 is we can customize the ribbon. I'm going to right click anywhere and say customize ribbon. Now right off the bat, we want to look over here. We have our same list, right? We can choose from. It's always important to say all commands, and you have everything in Excel, all the features in Excel. Over here, notice the developer ribbon is not shown by default. So you click this. That's for people who do VBA or macros, right? So you want to show that. I'm going to click OK. And sure enough, we can show the developer. Right click Customize, but you can customize ribbons just as we customize our quat there. So I'm going to go to Data, click on this, and Pivot Table is over on Insert, but I want it on Data, so I'm going to say a new group. And I'm going to come over here. Oh, let's uh, name this group. So we have pivot table. We're going to come over here. I'm going to click in this list and say all. Click in this list and type uh, P to jump down to the uh, P's. Pivot table. Let's see, which one is it that we want? Uh, actually, this is the old 2003 wizard. I'm going to select this one and say Add. And I'm going to add this one here also and click Add. The reason why it's nice to have this old one, the Pivot Table and Pivot Chart Wizard, it's a three-step wizard, is if you want a separate cache of data, you can use that, the old method. All right, I'm going to click OK. And so uh, in Data Now, whoa, that is so cool. So if I click in a data set and say Pivot Table, there it is. It's now in its proper home, the data. Or I click here, and there is the old three-step wizard that allow me to create a separate cache. Back when we did our uh, grouping date, if you want to group and date one pivot table but not another, use this one. Whoa. Uh, all right, so customizing. One other thing about customizing the uh, ribbon, you can actually create a whole new tab. Whoops. Oh, so right there, and then do new group just as we did before. I'm going to click Cancel. All right, so you can create your whole new thing. One last thing, uh, just in case you missed it in 2007, great new functions, count ifs, sum ifs, average ifs. The, the methods for, uh, well, the S, count if, does what you think it does. Count if some condition is met. Count all of Sue's records, sum all of Sue's records. Well, count if and sum if have been around 
for a long time, but they only did one condition. So what they did is in 2007, they added an s. These are new functions. And they added average if. Average if, in earlier versions, you would take count, uh, sum if divided by count if. But all of these s versions means you can have more than one criteria. So I'm going to use count if. Not only that, but count if and sum if still exist. But this S version, you can do one criteria. But the screen tips are more explicit. So people don't get as confused, especially when we look at the sum if in a second. It says clearly criteria range 1, criteria 1. So if I'm adding uh, sue and then product, the first range I need is sale rep. So I'm going to click there, control shift down arrow to highlight all the way. Now I'm going to hit the F4 key. I didn't really need to lock it here, but the F4 key jumps it back up, and that's convenient. Comma and criteria 1, well, that's the sales rep, so I'm going to click there. Comma, criteria range 2. So the screen tip keeps expanding and has incrementing numbers to help you figure out what you need to put into the argument. So now this is product, so I click there, control shift down arrow, F4, comma, and quad. All right, so 11. Now, some ifs. Now, this is the one where the new names really help. They put some range first. If you look at the old some if, it said range criteria and some range. So people would get confused and be like, range, what does that mean? Now, I, I actually remember when I learned first learned this, I would get confused. All right, But now, so with the S, they got rid of that confusion. Some range is first. You're not going to make any. Uh, mistake and the range instead of just called range it says criteria range all right so some range these are the sales control shift down our f4 criteria range one this will be uh, sales rep column control shift down our f4 and our sales rep comma and then our criteria range two that'll be our product control shift down our f4 comma, and notice the screen tip keeps on going. All right, so that's adding with two criteria, just a great new uh, feature. I don't think I have any formulas. There's so many different ways that people used to do it before these functions. All right, Excel 2010, lots of new amazing features. We'll see you next video.